If you would, turn your Bibles to Romans. Last Sunday, I was able to preach on Romans 1 through 4, and I really enjoyed being able to do that. It, it was basically a survey of the first four chapters of the book of Romans. And in fact, uh, later in the, in the main service, I'm going to do something similar in Galatians. We'll talk about that in a second, or later on. But I wanted to kind of follow up um, in, this, in this lesson this morning uh, after looking at Romans 1 through 4. And I actually want to go to Romans 5 and look at verse 1 there. Now, you may be thinking, well, Lucas, you told us last week we were going to do a series on the London Baptist Confession. And that's true. I want to do that. I'm going to be looking this week online where I can get a few copies of it because I'd like everybody to have their own copy of the Confession. Um, just to have, take home, you can keep it, uh, you can bring it here. It's good whenever you're going through a book or a confession that the people actually have it. So you guys can study at home, you can call me out uh, if I perhaps uh, err in some of my uh, teaching on it. Uh, it's good to, for that accountability for me. And it's good even, even though when we're done with the study for you to have access to that because it's very helpful resources. Uh, confessions are beneficial. And I talked about that last week, how important it is for us to, as Christians, have Christian confessions. In fact, all the way back to the early church, even even before the New Testament was finished being written, um, there was already confessions in the forms of hymns. There was hymns that the early Christians sang, confessing their faith in Christ. In fact, the Apostle Paul, in Philippians 2, quotes an early church hymn. Very interesting. We could talk about that um, perhaps another time. So in Romans chapter 5, in beginning in verse 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, but we're really going to focus on verse 1. I just want to give a little context by reading through these five verses. So the Apostle Paul writes in verse 1, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the really the, the main theme, the main thing I'd like us to look at, especially in verse one, is this is the concept of reconciliation with God. Reconciliation with God, being made right with our Creator. Last week I was able to highlight a lot of, um, of the bad news in Romans 1 through 3. But at the, toward the end of the sermon, I wasn't really able to give too much time to the good news, talk about Christ's death and His atonement. I was able to cover it, but not as much as I had liked to. And so I kind of want to go over some of what we looked at just to really through repetition, drill this into our minds. We want this to be upon our, the forefront of our minds. This reality of being reconciled to God is indeed the heart of our faith. It is the heart of the gospel message. In fact, it's the theme of Scripture all the way back in Genesis 3. We see sin enters in, man falls, but what does God immediately do? He promises the seed. And then He comes along to Abraham, and he promises the coming seed. He promises the fact that the Savior is going to come. And then in the New Testament is a a beautiful testimony, a unanimous testimony of the man who came to bring reconciliation between us and God. And that is the man Christ Jesus, our Lord. Even the word reconcile carries with it pretty strong meaning. It actually comes from the Latin word reconciliare, and it's two words, or it's really a prefix and a, and a main word put together, re and conciliare, or concile in English. And re, it means again or over again. And then concile or conciliare in the Latin means to bring together, to make friendly. And I think that's, that very well captures what the message of the gospel is, is it takes sinners who are enemies of God and brings them to become God's friends. In fact, in the book of James, you don't have to turn there, but in James chapter 2, this is put forth very plainly by the Apostle James. He says in verse 23, 
And he's speaking on Abraham's life. And he says this. He quotes Genesis 15.6. He says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Pretty astounding. And brethren, it's beautiful to know that we ourselves are the friends of God. That we have been made right with God. That we've been reconciled to our Creator. That we were once enemies. We were once aliens. Strangers to the Lord our God. But now... But now we have been brought into a right standing before Him. In fact, in this section of Scripture here in Romans 5, this is really what Paul is getting at when he talks about being um, made justified, being justified with God, having peace with God through Christ. And then in verses 2 through 5, talks about the results of salvation, really the fruits and evidences of conversion. And then that unfolds further in verse 6 where he talks about the love of Christ has been, as has been manifested toward us. And he continues in verse 7 and 8 and 9. Even in verse 10. Listen to the words. Listen to the language he uses in verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. He uses the word reconcile or reconciliation three times in these two verses. This is really what Paul's driving home to us. After having given us the gospel of grace, especially um, confined into chapter 3, verses 21 through 31, he summarizes all that he's said thus far. In fact, that's why at the beginning of the chapter, he uses the word therefore. Every time we see the word therefore, we need to ask ourselves this question. Why is the therefore? Therefore. What is it therefore? Don't be confused by my words. What is the therefore therefore? But the Apostle Paul, especially in his writings, uses the word therefore as a summarizing transition. He's, he's transitioning into a summarization of what he said so far. And that's what he does in verse 1, which is where I really want to focus here Just to give you a little context, as I've referenced already a couple of times, in chapter 1, chapter 2, Paul gives the bad news. Chapter 1, he says the pagans are evil. Chapter 2, he says the religious people are evil. Chapter 3, he says all of them together are evil. And then the end of chapter 3, he gives the good news. He says God has sent Christ to die for sin, to put away God's wrath, to, to save us from God's judgment, to save us from hell. He announces that glorious reality and then he brings it to a personal level. And he says in verse 28 of chapter 3, For we maintain that a man is justified, that is, they are made right with God by faith apart from the works of the law. He says salvation is a free gift of grace. And then in chapter 4, as we were able to skim over last week, we saw how salvation by faith is evidenced, is, is illustrated in the life of Abraham. And then at the end of chapter 4, Paul applies that. He makes application of that. In verse 22, he says, Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Talking about Abraham. He says, Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification." That's a beautiful summarization of the gospel of grace there in verse 25. And then that brings us right into chapter 5 where Paul says, Therefore, we've believed in God, we've believed the gospel of grace. And he he brings it all together in this one jewel of a verse. And really this verse, as I just said a moment ago, flows into verses 2 through 5. It just pours out that reality of our having, um, having perseverance in tribulation and joy in the glory of God and hope and character and all the things he speaks of in those verses. So there's three things I want us to see in verse 1. And it breaks down into three sections very, very well, this one verse does. Firstly, the first part of the verse is justification or reconciliation by faith alone. 
Second part is reconciliation means peace. And then the third part is that it is through Christ alone. This reconciliation we have with God is only through Christ and only through Him alone. The first thing is we're going to look at is reconciliation by faith alone. This is the chief principle of the Christian church. This is why we're Protestants. This is why we're not Catholics. The Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, says that if you believe you're saved by grace through faith alone, then you are anathema. It's a Greek word for damned. You're cursed. They pronounce cursing upon us. In fact, even the term Protestant means you're protesting. It's kind of sad, but I'm sure that I could go around this whole area here in Lawrence and and, and go to people in churches, Protestant churches, and say, oh, you're a Protestant. What are you protesting? And they couldn't give me an answer. Brethren, we need to understand the historical significance of, re- of reconciliation by faith alone. Salvation by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. We have a spiritual lineage as Protestants. We have a spiritual heritage. Men of, of strong faith in our Lord Jesus Christ have stood for this article. In fact, many of them lost their lives. Many women even lost their lives because they stood for the, the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. We hold to the fact that salvation cannot be earned by work. That's so clear. That's probably the, one of the most clear things in Scripture. I mean, just all over, and especially in the book of Romans. I mean, the Romans is just filled with this language. In fact, the, as I just quoted verse 28 when he says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That was a horrible thing to say in Paul's day among his own people. They exalted the law. They thought they could be justified by the law, that they could be saved. He says, no, it's by faith. And, he, and, he, and guess who he calls to his attention? Who does he call to use his example? Abraham, the first Jew. The man who was called by God to be the father of the Israelite nation. He calls him. And he uses him as an illustration that salvation is a free gift of grace. To give you a little bit of an idea of the historical significance of salvation by faith alone or reconciliation by faith alone being made right with God is um, one thing I'd like to bring up is the Protestant Reformation. Obviously, us protesting the Roman Catholic Church and us being Protestants that had to had started at one time. And in fact, it's very interesting. This year, 2017, marks the 500-year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. In the year 1517, a man by the name of Martin Luther went to the the castle church door in Wittenberg in Germany and nailed his 95 theses to the church door. Well, the 95 theses are basically 95 little statements. That's a pretty long piece of paper and just a bunch of statements about the error of the Catholic Church. He talks a lot about uh, indulgences, which is basically buying forgiveness. The Catholic Church taught you could buy forgiveness Literally, with money. You pay money, they give you a piece of paper, and it says you've been forgiven of your sin. I'm not even kidding you. They did that. And Martin Luther thought that was absolutely ridiculous. And he protested the Roman Catholic Church. He wanted to reform it. He wanted to change it and make it better. He wanted to to bring it to purity. And so over the next two years, he studies, he learns. In fact, he uh, was a professor at a university teaching Scripture. Um, and he would read through the book of Romans, and he was terrified, terrified of Romans. And I'll, I'll, I'll read to you some of his own words. He says, I had indeed been captivated with an extraordinary ador for understanding Paul in the epistle to the Romans. But up till then, it was not the cold blood out of the heart, but a single word in chapter 1. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed. That's, that's verse 17 of chapter 1. Listen to what he says. That had, it stood in my way. For I hated that word, righteousness of God, which according to the use and custom of all the teachers, I had been taught to understand philosophically regarding the formal or act of righteousness, as they call it, with which God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. What he's saying is this. He saw in um, chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul says, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. He saw that wrongly as God's wrath. He thought the gospel was a revelation that God's going to punish sinners and damn them. And he was terrified. Because up to this point, he still wasn't converted. He was a Catholic priest. I mean, a Catholic, not a Catholic priest, a Catholic monk. 
lived many years of his life trying to earn righteousness before God. He would stay up all night doing prayer vigils. He'd pray out in the snow. A baron wouldn't, wouldn't even cover himself. He brought much pain upon himself, upon his life, trying to be righteous enough to go to heaven, and it wouldn't work. It could not make him right with God. So he has this troubled conscience. He continues, Though I had lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was, pl- uh, that he was, that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners secretly. And secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. He's terrified. And he gets to hate God, he begins to grow bitter and depressed. Could not do enough religious rituals, could not buy enough indulgences. In fact, the reason he became a monk was simply this. One day he was headed home on a carriage and a thunderstorm came and lightning struck near him, hit the ground near him. And he was so terrified, he cried out, he said, I'll be a monk. He was afraid. He's fearful of going to hell. We just talked about it a little bit just a few minutes ago about people who are afraid to go to hell they just want to go to heaven because they're just afraid to go to hell. It's not a, certainly not a good reason to go to heaven or to want to go to heaven. You should want to go to heaven because Christ is there. So it was a very wrong motivation but it was out of fear. He lives the rest of his life or this period of his life in fear. And, but he continues, he says, Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words. Ha! He he learned a proper scripture interpretation. He paid attention to the context. He says, Namely, in in it the righteousness of God is revealed, as it is written. Now notice this. He he quotes what Paul says in Romans 1.17. He through faith is righteous shall live. Our Bibles might word it a little differently. The righteous shall live by faith. In other words, you're saved by faith alone. And he realized this. He says, There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness, which with which merciful, a merciful God justifies us by faith, as is written. He through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. That is incredible. And so, and that was the year 1519. So in two years, we'll celebrate the 500 years since Martin Luther was converted. So in, it's very interesting that he started the Protestant Re- um, Reformation and wasn't even converted until two years later. Wasn't actually saved until two years later. But he get, he's, he's born again and he begins to serve God with his life. Mighty man of faith. Uh, other men like John Calvin, John Knox, John Wycliffe. A lot of Johns there. It was a common name back in those days. Men who stood for the faith. And they stood for this. Salvation by faith alone. So that's the historical significance for us as believers. Obviously... Of course, throughout Scripture, from beginning to end, as, as um, we just quoted a, a few texts a moment ago, Scripture testifies to the reality we're saved by faith alone. The second thing is that reconciliation means peace. We have peace with God. We have a right standing with God. See, dear friends, brethren, we stand um, before God at, by default as His enemies, as I said a moment ago. We're at war. We're, we're, we're battling one another. If there are two kingdoms that are at war with one another... They're going to use all their resources and all their time and all their energy trying to defeat their enemy. They'll even hire or have skilled reconnaissance troops spying on the other kingdom, the other kingdom, the other army, trying to defeat them. They're using their energy fighting one another. And that's really what a sinner is doing against God. They're actively resisting the righteous reign of the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. They are, they are turning away from the Lord God who made them. But the gospel puts that away, puts that sin that they have before God away. Christ comes and He dies for sin. He satisfies God's wrath against sin. And He rises from the dead on the third day. That the wrath of God that the sinner deserves is put on Christ. 
And therefore, God can be peaceful toward the sinner. He can show kindness toward his enemy. He can show mercy. And that's precisely why the Apostle Paul says it there at the second part of verse 1. We have peace with God. Oftentimes there will be, and I've heard um, from brethren of mine, and even I myself have struggled with this before, so we'll have a troubled conscience. We'll even lack assurance from time to time. You know, am I really saved? Am I really converted? Am I really a Christian? Am I really right with God? Is He really my friend? The assurance comes from this. Genuine assurance comes from this. The realization of the security of Christ's work. The realization of Christ's work being secured for us. That is that He truly did die for our sins. He truly did rise from the dead on the third day. That that really did happen. That brings assurance to the soul. That brings us to a realization of our peace with God that's been accomplished for us by Christ. And therefore, as verse 2 says, what happens to us? Therefore, whom also we have obtained our... Excuse me. He says, through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult or we, we are joyful. We are having joy in the hope of the glory of God. When we are converted and we have that assurance of salvation, we have joy knowing what? We're going to enter God's glory. We're going to enter His rest. We're going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and we have joy in that. And he continues in verse 3, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Incredible. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Thirdly, the last part of the verse is that it's reconciliation through Christ alone. This reconciliation we have with God that is by faith and that brings us to be at peace with God is only through Christ. And of course, I'm speaking to the choir on this. Is You all know that, the exclusivity of Christ. But I want to encourage you with this. Even when our world condemns us for condemning them, for saying, if you don't believe on Christ... You'll be lost. When they ridicule us for that, we need to take heart because we are preaching the message. We are standing for the truth. Our Lord Jesus said, if they hated Him, they will hate us. If they persecuted Him, they will certainly persecute us. For we are Christians. We are followers of Christ. We are walking in His footsteps. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. You're, you're going to be like Him. When someone becomes a Christian, they're saying, I I'm committing by the grace of God to live as Jesus lived and to say what Jesus said. Now, that's pretty astounding because when you read the Gospels and you see the things Jesus said, what he did, what did he do over and over? He stepped on toes, offended people, lost many of his disciples, most of them, because he offended them by the truth. We have way too many preachers these days who are even, even not even wanting to offend Christians. Brethren, I love you, care for you, but if I don't offend you, quite regularly, then probably something is wrong. I want you to be convicted. I want myself to be convicted by the Word of God. It's not that we need to try to be offensive or try to be overly hateful or, or any of that sin, or any, anything in that way, or angry toward people. Not that. The truth itself, by its nature, is offensive to the sinful heart. We don't have to try and, and add to that. I'm not ever going to try and offend you or try and make you upset. But brethren, the truth eventually will convict you of something in your life. It convicts me all the time. In fact, I love what uh, one, one of my favorite preachers, Dr. Stephen Lawson, he said, uh, he said I read, or he, what is it, how do, how do you say it? He said, I've read many books, but the Bible reads me. And I thought that was so profound, because that is so true, exactly what the Word of God does. It's offensive, and it reads us, and it calls us out in our sin. Let us not be discouraged to preach Christ alone. Christ alone. It's not just by faith alone and it's not just by grace alone. It is in Christ alone. If your faith is in anything else, you don't have faith, you don't have genuine saving faith, it will not save you. You can't trust even in just some unknown God, in the unknown God of, of America, which is basically a, a, just a, a generic 
you know, we see it on police cars, we see it on our, 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 our tags on our cars. In God we trust. It's a very generic, general, well, it's just God. Just this general, unknown God. And that's what the Apostle Paul went to Athens to rebuke the Athenians for. Because what were they doing? They were worshiping an unknown God. They were so religious. They had so many different idols in the city that just to be sure they had covered all the gods they could. They made an altar to all the unknown gods. To any god that they forgot, they made an altar to. The altar to the unknown god. So the Apostle Paul comes and says, okay. He says, the God whom you worship in ignorance. In other words, you don't know him? I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell you about him. And he did that and God blessed his ministry there. Brethren, let's preach that it's in Christ alone. Let's rest in the reality today on the Lord's Day, on the day of rest. Rest in the reality that we are reconciled to God by faith alone. And we are made at peace with God. And that it is in Christ alone. It is in Him we've placed our trust and our hope. And we will be brought into celestial glory. We will. We have that hope of glory. That hope of entering into God's eternal rest through Christ. If you've yet to experience this, repent and believe the gospel of salvation. We've seen here that we're reconciled by faith alone. Or reconciliation, this reconciliation we have by faith alone brings about peace. And then thirdly, that it is in Christ alone. Let's pray. Precious Father, I pray you'd seal these truths upon our hearts and minds. Father, you would transform us by your grace and for your glory. And the glory of Christ Jesus, your Son. We praise you for who he is. For the fact that we, have, by your grace alone, that you have enabled us, as the, uh, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther said, that the faith is simply your work in us. That you are working in us to uphold this faith. Lord, you've given us the grace to put our faith in Christ, to be reconciled to you, to be made at peace with you. And it's all found in him. So Lord, may we go out into this lost and dying world and preach this eternal gospel, this saving gospel of grace. It's in His name we pray. Amen.